Welcome to a new episode from English Plus Podcast. This is your host, Danny, and I'm so happy to welcome you to our brand new episode series, Let's Talk Science. Every week, we will discuss important scientific concepts, but don't worry, it's not going to be specific to scientists only. On the contrary, we have designed Let's Talk Science to help everyone learn more about important scientific facts and concepts without having to be a professional. It's actually science for everyone. Today, we're going to talk about brain myths, those misconceptions people have about our human brain. We will try to bust some of these myths based on scientific evidence, and hopefully we will pique your curiosity to dig in a little deeper and learn more about these myths. It's our goal in English Plus, after all, never stop learning. Before we start with our episode, let me remind you that you can find a lot of other learning opportunities on our website, EnglishPlusPodcast.com. So after you've finished listening to this episode, take some time to explore our website, and I bet you will find something interesting you would want to learn more about. Take your English and knowledge to the next level with English Plus. Now let me welcome Ben, who's going to co-host this episode with me. We're going to talk about those myths together, and hopefully... You will be a little wiser after you finish listening to this episode. Welcome to the show, Ben. Thank you, Danny. I'm glad to be here. Same here. Today, you and I are going to discuss some brain myths with our listeners, and maybe we should start with a very simple question. What are brain myths? Well, brain myths are misconceptions about the way the brain functions, often spread as scientific facts, but are actually false or unproven. So why do people have misconceptions about the way the brain functions? People have misconceptions about the brain due to a variety of reasons such as misunderstandings, misinformation, anecdotal evidence, cultural beliefs, and overgeneralization of scientific findings. Additionally, the brain is a complex and poorly understood organ, making it a lot easier for myths to persist. I believe sometimes brain myths are easy to believe in because they make up a better story than the scientific proven one. So people tend to believe a more exciting story to explain the things happening around them than to accept the scientific proven explanation that might not be as exciting. What do you think about that? Yes, that's a good point. People often prefer engaging and easy-to-understand explanations for complex concepts, even if they are not scientifically accurate. This can lead to the spread and perpetuation of brain myths, despite the availability of more accurate information. Furthermore, a lack of scientific literacy and critical thinking skills can also contribute to the belief in brain myths. All right. So let's tackle a few concepts that might or might not be true about our own brains. Let us start with a concept that says our brains are perfectly designed. Are they perfectly designed? Well, no. The brain is not perfectly designed. Evolution is a process of trial and error. And the brain has developed through a combination of adaptations that have helped our ancestors survive and reproduce. While the human brain is capable of remarkable things, it also has its flaws and limitations. For example, the brain struggles with multitasking and has a tendency to experience negative biases and hallucinations. These limitations are simply the result of the brain's evolution and not a flaw in its design. So is it correct to say that our brains are a product of evolution and they are shaped by natural selection and include many inefficient hacks? Yes, that's correct. The human brain has evolved over time through the process of natural selection, resulting in adaptations that have allowed our ancestors to survive and reproduce. However, these adaptations have resulted in inefficiencies and hacks that are not always the most optimal solution but they have been passed down nonetheless because they were beneficial in our ancestral environments. So, in a sense, the brain is a patchwork of adaptations, some of which may not be perfectly efficient, but they have allowed our species to survive and thrive nonetheless. Can you give me an example of one of these inefficient hacks? Sure. One example of an inefficient hack in the human brain is our tendency to experience pain. Pain serves an important function in alerting us to potential injury or harm, but it can also be experienced 
even in the absence of any real danger. This is because the brain evolved to err on the side of caution and respond to potential danger quickly, even if it results in false alarms or pain in some cases. In this sense, the experience of pain is an inefficient hack because it can lead to discomfort and suffering even when it is not necessary for survival. All right, so that was one brain myth busted. Our brains are not perfectly designed. Now let's talk about another brain myth. What about the size of our brain? The common belief is that bigger brains are smarter. How much truth is there in that conception? The belief that bigger brains equal greater intelligence is definitely a myth. While brain size can be an indicator of intelligence to some extent, it is far from a perfect correlation. There are many other factors that contribute to a person's intelligence, such as the number and efficiency of neural connections, the availability of certain neurotransmitters, and the overall organization of the brain. Furthermore, some of the smartest animals, such as birds and dolphins, have relatively small brains compared to their body size. So while brain size is an interesting factor to consider, it is not a determining factor of intelligence. What about Einstein's brain? Since it was saved for post-mortem analysis, did it show any correlation between size and intelligence? The analysis of Albert Einstein's brain did reveal some structural differences compared to the average brain, but it did not show any relationship between brain size and intelligence. Einstein's brain was actually slightly smaller than average, but it had a greater number of specialized regions, particularly in areas associated with mathematical and spatial reasoning. These findings suggest that intelligence is determined by a complex interplay of structural and functional factors in the brain rather than simply its size. However, it's important to note that Einstein's brain was a unique case, and these findings may not be generalizable to the general population. So can we say that intelligence and brain size, even in humans, are not moderately correlated, and when you look across species, the correlation is even smaller? Yes, that's correct. The correlation between brain size and intelligence, even within the human species, is only moderate. When looking across different species, the correlation becomes even weaker. Intelligence is a complex trait that is determined by a combination of genetic and environmental factors. And brain size is just one of many factors that can contribute to a species' cognitive abilities. Therefore, it is incorrect to assume that a larger brain automatically equates to greater intelligence or that a smaller brain automatically means lower intelligence. All right then, now let's move on to tackle yet another brain myth. This one has to do with mental illness. Is it true that mental illness is just a chemical imbalance? No, it's not accurate to say that mental illness is solely due to a chemical imbalance. Mental illnesses are complex and multifactorial and can be caused by a combination of genetic, biological, environmental, and psychological factors. While imbalances in neurotransmitters such as serotonin or dopamine can play a role in the development of certain mental illnesses, they are not the only cause. Additionally, many mental illnesses are not fully understood and the exact causes are still being researched. Therefore, it is not accurate to simplify mental illness as just a chemical imbalance in the brain. Rather, mental illness is a result of the complex interplay of multiple factors that affect the brain and behavior. So is it not true to say that when the chemicals in your brain are out of balance, your brain can function properly? It is not accurate to say that when chemicals in the brain are out of balance, the brain cannot function properly. Now, while imbalances in certain neurotransmitters can impact brain functions and contribute to the development of mental illnesses, it is a much more complex and nuanced issue than simply attributing it to a chemical imbalance. Neurotransmitters are just one aspect of brain function, and there are many other factors that can impact brain function, such as genetics, environment, and lifestyle factors. Furthermore, mental illnesses are not just due to imbalanced neurotransmitters, but also result from a complex interplay of factors, including biological, environmental, and psychological factors. And therefore, it is not accurate to simplify mental illness as just a result of chemical balance. 
So is it safe to say that neurotransmitters are only one part of healthy brain function and their levels are in constant flux? Yes, that's correct. Neurotransmitters are just one part of healthy brain function and their levels can change in response to various factors such as stress, illness, lifestyle, and medication. And as we said, while neurotransmitter imbalances can contribute to mental illnesses, it's just one aspect of the complex and multifactorial nature of mental health. Healthy brain function involves a delicate balance of many factors, including neurotransmitter levels, nerve cell activity, and gene expression. Additionally, brain function is also influenced by environmental and psychological factors such as stress, relationships, and life experiences. So again, it is not accurate to simplify mental health as solely due to neurotransmitter imbalances as it is a complex and multifaceted issue. So another brain myth busted. And now let's move on and talk about the right brain people and left brain people. Is it true that creative people are right-brained? No, it is not accurate to say that creative people are right-brained. The notion that individuals can be classified as right-brained or left-brained is a popular but oversimplified idea that has no basis in scientific fact. The human brain is a highly integrated and interconnected system, and both hemispheres work together to perform various tasks and functions. While certain areas of the brain may be more active during certain tasks, it does not mean that one hemisphere is more dominant or better than the other. Creativity is a complex trait that involves many different brain regions and cannot be attributed to a single area or hemisphere of the brain. Additionally, creativity is influenced by a combination of genetic, environmental, and cultural factors and cannot be solely attributed to one's handedness or brain dominance. Therefore, it is not accurate to classify individuals as right-brained or left-brained. But is there no truth in having one side of the brain as the dominant side? It is true that some tasks and functions may show a preference for one hemisphere of the brain over the other, and this is referred to as lateralization. For example, language processing tends to be lateralized to the left hemisphere in most people. However, it is important to note that both hemispheres are always working together and communicating with each other in a highly interconnected manner, even for lateralized tasks. Additionally, the degree of lateralization can vary between individuals and is influenced by multiple factors, including genetics and life experiences. So it is not accurate to describe an individual as right-brained or left-brained as the brain is a highly integrated and complex system and both hemispheres, again, are involved in most tasks and functions. So is it safe to say that the hemispheres are highly interconnected and work together in sync much of the time? Although there is some lateralization of function, many functions are bilateral. And can we say that the left brain is also necessary for creativity? Yes, that is accurate. The two hemispheres of the brain are highly interconnected and work together in sync much of the time. While some tasks may show a preference for one hemisphere, as we said, many functions are bilateral and involve the coordinated activity of both hemispheres. And remember, as we said, while certain areas of the brain may be more active during certain tasks, it does not mean that one hemisphere is more dominant or better than the other. So the notion of left-brained versus right-brained individuals is a popular but oversimplified idea that has no basis in scientific fact. Both hemispheres are involved in creativity, and creativity is a complex trait that involves many different brain regions and is influenced by a combination of genetic, environmental, and cultural factors. So it is not accurate to describe individuals as right-brained or left-brained. I'm saying it again and again, but it is important to understand that the brain is a highly integrated and complex system that works together to perform various tasks and functions. All right then, another myth busted. Now let's move on and talk about the brains of men and women. Is it true that men's and women's brains are structurally different? Well, research has shown that there are some differences in brain structure between men and women, but these differences are small and do not fully determine differences in cognition, behavior, or personality. Additionally, many similarities exist in brain structure between men and women, and there's a great deal of overlap. 
It is important to note that brain structure and function are influenced by a complex interplay of genetic, hormonal, and environmental factors, and the effect of any single factor is not really well understood. The notion that men and women have inherently different cognitive abilities or ways of thinking is a popular but controversial idea that has no basis in scientific fact. It is clear that both men and women can exhibit a wide range of cognitive abilities and personality traits, and it is wrong to make generalizations about entire groups based on gender. Additionally, it is important to recognize that gender is a social and cultural construct, and individual differences within gender categories are much greater than differences between categories. So is there no such a thing as a male and a female brain? No, there is no such a thing as a male brain or a female brain. Brains are not inherently male or female. And the idea that there are distinct fixed differences in brain structure or function based on gender is again a popular but oversimplified idea that has no basis in scientific fact. While research has identified some differences in brain structure between men and women on average, these differences are small and do not determine differences in cognition, behavior, or personality. And remember, there is a great deal of overlap in brain structure and function between men and women, and individual differences within each gender category are much greater than differences between these categories. Anyway, gender is a complex, multidimensional construct that is influenced by a combination of biological, psychological, and cultural factors. And it is important to recognize that individuals do not fit into simple categories based on their gender only. So how much of the brain differences we see in men and women are a result of culture rather than biology? And can we ever tease those two apart? It is difficult to tease apart the effects of biology and culture on brain differences between men and women, as these factors often interact in complex and interrelated ways. Culture can shape the way people think, behave, and interact, and this in turn can influence brain structure and function. For example, cultural and social expectations about gender roles can affect the types of activities and experiences that individuals engage in, which can lead to differences in brain structure and function over time. At the same time, there are likely biological differences between men and women, such as differences in hormones and genetics, that can influence brain development and function. However, the extent to which these differences are due to biology or culture is not well understood and is a topic of ongoing research. It is also important to note that any observed differences between the brains of men and women on average do not apply to all individuals, and individual differences within each gender category are much greater than differences between categories. And for one last time, gender is a complex, multidimensional construct that is influenced by a variety of factors and it is important to avoid making generalizations or assumptions about individuals based solely on their gender. All right then, now let's talk about one more brain myth. This one has to do with memory. Now we know that some people have better memories than other people, and some people depend too much on their memories as they believe their memories are perfectly accurate. How true is that? How accurate is our memory? Memory is not a perfect and unchanging record of past events, but is instead a dynamic and reconstructive process that is subject to errors and biases. The accuracy of memories can be influenced by a variety of factors such as the passage of time, stress, emotions, and expectations. As a result, memories can change and become distorted over time, and they can sometimes be influenced by false information or misleading cues. It is also important to note that different types of memories, such as long-term memories, working memories, and implicit memories, are stored and processed differently in the brain and can vary in terms of their accuracy and stability. Additionally, there is substantial individual variation in memory ability, and some people are indeed better able to store and recall information than others. However, even highly skilled memory experts can still be influenced by memory errors and biases, and it is not accurate to assume that anyone's memory is perfectly accurate. Overall, while memory is a valuable tool for helping us navigate our world, it is important to recognize its limitations and be cautious while relying on our memories, especially in situations where accuracy is important. So it is wrong to say that our memory is an accurate reflection of what happened in the past. 
It is incorrect to say that our memory is an accurate reflection of what happened in the past. Our memories are not a perfect record of events, but are instead a dynamic and reconstructive process that is influenced by a variety of factors and can change over time. As a result, memories can become distorted and biased. And remember, this is very important, they can sometimes be influenced by false information or misleading cues. But sometimes this can be dangerous, especially when we rely on an eyewitness account in a court of law. This person depends totally on what he or she can remember, but since our memories are not perfect, can we still depend on eyewitness recollection of events to determine the fate of other people, like in a trial? Eyewitness testimony can be unreliable, especially in high-stress or traumatic situations where the accuracy of recall can be affected. Eyewitness testimony should be used with caution, and other types of evidence such as physical evidence or documentation should be considered as well. In court, multiple eyewitness accounts can help establish a more accurate picture of events. It's also important for lawyers and judges to be aware of the limitations of eyewitness testimony and to consider factors like the passage of time, suggestion, and stress that can impact memory accuracy. The use of eyewitness testimony in the legal system highlights the importance of considering multiple types of evidence and being mindful of the limitations of human memory. Now, since we said that eyewitness testimony can be unreliable, what do you think is the best way to do it? How should we interview potential eyewitnesses to get the most accurate picture of what actually happened? To get the most accurate picture of what actually happened, potential eyewitnesses should be interviewed as soon as possible after the event in a non-suggestive manner and with the use of open-ended questions to avoid planting false information. It is also helpful to have multiple eyewitness accounts and to compare them to physical evidence when available. So, is it safe to say that memory is reconstructive, which means that each time we remember an event, we have to build up the memory from scratch, and every instance of remembering changes the way that the memory will be retrieved in the future? Is that correct? Yes, it's correct to say that the memory is reconstructive and can change each time it's retrieved, meaning that memories can become distorted over time and may not be a completely accurate reflection of the past events. Hence, eyewitness testimony can be unreliable and is just one piece of evidence that should be considered among other factors in a trial. So if memory is reconstructive and prone to inaccuracies, what is the purpose of it? Well, the purpose of memory is to store and retrieve information that is important for our survival, adaptation, and functioning in daily life. Memory helps us learn from past experiences, make decisions, and form relationships. However, due to its reconstructive nature, it's important to acknowledge that memory can be fallible and can be influenced by a variety of factors. All right then, that was another myth busted. And let me tell you, my friend, I really enjoyed our discussion about brain myths today. Maybe we should do it again later and talk about other brain myths. Definitely. Brain myths are fascinating and it's always a good idea to challenge and understand them better. I'd be happy to chat again about other brain myths and scientific findings about the brain. Same here. Well, thank you very much for sharing all this valuable information about the human brain with me, Ben. You're welcome. It was my pleasure to be with you on the show. Well, with that, we come to the end of today's episode. I hope you learned a lot and enjoyed the episode. Remember, never stop learning with English Plus. And you can easily do that by visiting our website, EnglishPlusPodcast.com. Explore the site and surely you will find something interesting you would like to learn more about. This will be everything for today's episode. This is your host, Danny. Thank you very much for listening. I will see you next time.